Welcome to State of the Pacific 2014. I'm James Gugha, editor at the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. Today I'm joined by Professor Sinclair Dinan and Dr John Cox from the State Society and Governance in Melanesia program, here to discuss some of the major transitions taking place across the region. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Morning, Pleasure. James. <coughs> Sinclair, um, if I could turn to you first. Um, perhaps one of the biggest developments in 2014 are scheduled ele elections in Fiji and the country's seeming return to the democratic fold. What does this mean for the country itself and the Pacific in general? Well, it's clearly very significant for Fiji, having experienced almost eight years without an elected government um, and having sort of resisted uh, quite a lot of international pressure <coughs> over the years to return to democracy. Um, uh, we've also witnessed uh, very recently a significant change in Australia's policy towards Fiji from a uh, fairly sort of standoff, censorious position to one of, one of engagement. Um, and I think there's great expectations in Fiji as well as more broadly around the region about this prospect of returning to democracy. Um, I think some of the bigger issues, I mean, there's been a lot of fallout uh, indirectly from what's happened in Fiji. Um, including with regional organisations like the Pacific Island Forum, um, which is based in Fiji and, and, and previously was, was certainly the premier uh, regional organisation for <coughs> member states. Um, PIF has, has been adversely affected, I think, by developments in Fiji. Um, and we've seen a growth of sub-regional uh, organisations, most notably the Melanesian spearhead groups. There's been a lot of um, movement that has been going on around the Fiji uh, situation, so its resolution, I think, will um, hopefully provide a, a clarity um, that, that has been missing. And more broadly speaking, there's been a lot of major political developments in the region as well. Uh, Solomon Islands, Bougainville um, <coughs> and New Caledonia. What do these mean for the region? Well, there, there are other examples of, of fairly significant transitions in particular countries. And in the case of New Caledonia and in Bougainville, there is the, the possibility of referendums, um, uh, which will determine their future political status. In the one case, uh, whether um, independence uh, occurs or it continues um, to be part of France and the case of Bougainville, whether it, it also moves on towards an independent political status or remains an autonomous region of, um, of uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, in the case of Solomon Islands, what we see is the, the first election following the drawdown or the transition from the decade-long uh, regional assistance mission to Solomon Islands. Um, and uh, during that period, there's obviously been a, a great deal of engagement um, in the area of working with government institutions, uh, in the area of trying to improve uh, governance more broadly and service delivery. Um, how is that going to be reflected um, in the voting patterns of, of Solomon Islands faced with uh, an election later this year? Um, in some ways, uh, all of these uh, developments are, are separate, but they do, um, I think, sort of indicate that the, 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 the region doesn't stand still. Uh, it's a region of, of considerable diversity. Um, and the international um, actors who are engaging in that region are also uh, changing uh, the, the, the larger geostrategic um, environment in the Pacific sees the return, um, rhetorically at any rate, of the US after a long period away. Um, we see relatively new actors like China taking a, a great deal of interest in the region. Um, and we see uh, other actors engaging as well. So the, the, the geostrategic um, sort of shifts that are taking place I think are very significant. We'll have to watch how these play out. Um, they clearly have implications for Australia. For a long time, Australia, as an external actor, um, has had this part of the world very much to itself. Um, that is no longer the case. Um, in some countries, notably Papua New Guinea, the economy has been growing at uh, an incredible rate uh, on the back of a, a major resource boom. 
um, and um, that has an impact on the leverage of external uh, players such as Australia that traditionally have sought to exercise their influence primarily through aid. Um, we see, uh, as a result of these economic developments, uh, considerably less reliance on aid in a place like Papua New Guinea. And John, um, a range of new actors, as Sinclair has just mentioned, like countries like China, are operating in the Pacific in very different ways. Um, what are they doing? What impact is this having on the region? But also in terms of development, what are the Pacific populace and people doing themselves? Yeah, look, I, I think these are the big questions that our presenters are going to dig into in the course of the next two days in the State of the Pacific Conference. But they are really big questions and we just can't ever know enough about China's role in the Pacific. And we have a number of scholars here at the ANU who are working on that kind of thing. And I suppose, I don't know um, how much the audience here knows about China in the Pacific, but it's, it's not necessarily a story about a threat to our interests as a country. And I think some of the material that will be presented in State of the Pacific will show how China and Australia are actually cooperating on development assistance. But that said, I think Australia is used to being the dominant regional power and, and so there, there is a, a change in that dynamic. Um, not only at the government level, but also in terms of private sector investments. And I think one of the disturbing things that a few of us are picking up um, in PNG, Solomon Islands, and perhaps in other places around the region is um, populist anti-Chinese um, activism. So that's um, a matter of concern and, and unrest, and I suppose, is a bit of a wake-up call to, to some of us about you can read the economic statistics at one level and yet that's not necessarily how the population experiences economic growth or economic change. And I think, again, in some of the, the sessions that we're holding over the next few days, we'll see how are um, people in Papua New Guinea or people in Vanuatu or people in Fiji responding to some of these changing economic dynamics. What are they doing themselves to uh, earn their livelihoods? What are the, some of the new opportunities? Um, we've got some people in from the uh, Pacific South Pacific Commission who do work on um, organic agriculture and free trade and that's really a movement about creating new markets for Pacific ag agricultural products in New Zealand and Australia and further afield. So there are some very creative things happening. It's 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 not a story of doom and gloom and disaster. Although of course you know we have had some big disasters in the region this year. I'm thinking of the Solomon Islands floods in March, and you know we're still um, looking at what what the longer term impacts of events like that are, and and that'll be a little bit tested, I suppose, in uh, the Solomon Islands elections this year, which we we're also bringing in some experts to discuss. So there's. There's, there's an enormous amount going on and uh, it's sort of hard to, to uh, encapsulate it in a, in a snappy answer, but, uh, but it, it's a very dynamic region and there's lots of change and, and a lot of the change is quite progressive and exciting as well as um, in some cases a bit disturbing and, and foreboding. And you also alluded to this notion of aid from the region rather than aid coming into the region earlier. Can you extrapolate on that a little bit more and explain what you mean by that premise? Um, well, I mean, there's there's lots of different ways of approaching it, but um, I mean, I think aid donors are always trying to find more effective ways of delivering their aid, and they're always trying to generate um, more um, buy-in, I suppose, from their recipients, more ownership, more initiative. Uh, and I think one of the things we'll be profiling is how um, people in the Pacific are actually taking that initiative themselves and in a sense are not sitting around waiting for Australian aid to um, to rescue them from some terrible situation. They're, they're there, they're selling betel nut in the markets. Um, this is Papua New Guinea's biggest local commodity which aid donors have absolutely nothing to do with and a whole lot of livelihoods for, um, well, probably millions of people in PNG are connected to that trade. So that that's that's sort of one example of of um, this kind of local initiative, things that are happening outside the state, things that are happening outside the regulatory frameworks, outside the influence of aid donors, and yet shape those, the grounds uh, of the kind of interventions that perhaps Australia wants to try out in stimulating economic growth in the Pacific. Yeah. Fantastic. And now if I could turn to both of you on this question, 
and as Sinclair alluded earlier, Australia seems to be retreating from the region to some extent, particularly with major aid spending cuts uh, by the most recent government. How would you describe our country's future in the region? And in particular, does the region need us for its future? I think it's <coughs> a very big question. And, and again, I mean, the region is made up of lots of different countries with um, different needs, different challenges. Um, Australia, I think, will continue to be a major player in the region uh, for all kinds of reasons, geographic, historical, and so on. Um, I think the, the um, current sort of emphasis on uh, reviewing um, the nature of uh, aid relationships, I mean, this is something that goes on all the time, so it's not necessarily something new and it's something um, that has to be done, I think, um, with significant changes, some of which we've been talking about occurring within the region, um, business as usual is no longer um, an appropriate uh, way forward. And Australia has to think very carefully in relation to particular countries, how it can best assist um, processes um, underway in those countries and I don't think that there is a, a one-size-fits-all uh, approach that it can adopt. Um, I think, I mean, of the lessons of a very long history of aid um, being provided by Australia in the region, uh, one of the very clear lessons um, is that Australia needs to have a much better understanding um, of those countries with which it's engaging. Um, the nature of the, the, the dynamics at work in those countries um, and to be able to tailor its engagement you know, to uh, those very particular contacts. I think uh, another thing, and this alludes to what John was saying earlier on, that a lot of the transformation that is occurring in the region has nothing to do with aid. Um, it, it, it's occurring because of economic change, um, it's occurring because of technological change um, and also there are organic changes taking place. Um, Papua New Guinea is another good example where you have an embryonic middle class emerging um, which is not dependent on the state um, uh, for its well-being and which is beginning to be quite vocal I think about a lot of the, the challenges um, uh, that uh, Papua New Guinea faces, uh, including, for example, corruption. Um, and it's really when, when people in the country's concern start addressing those issues that I think we're going to see um, significant progress. So uh, uh, another broad lesson from this much longer hi um, history of, of aid in the region is that uh, aid is only one relatively small part of a much more complex uh, picture of, of transformation and change um, and that perhaps in the past our expectations of what we can achieve through aid have been uh, unrealistically high. Um, but I think the, the changing reality on the ground is that that, that lesson is, is, is becoming very apparent. I think Sinclair that um, in some ways our keynote speakers encapsulate those two trends that uh, on the one hand we've got Amanda Donegi who's a young businesswoman from Papua New Guinea. Uh, she's a publisher. She's uh, put out this uh, new women's magazine that is full of very empowering images of a whole range of Papua New Guinean women. And um, one of our colleagues, Kerry from Spark, has done some research analysing this. But, uh, but this Stella magazine, Amanda's magazine, has this vision of empowered Pacific women. Um, it's not... Um, what you'd think of as a conventional um, feminist um, you know, kind of tract or anything. It, it's something that gets a, a, a very wide readership and it's an intelligently put together magazine. But, um, and on the other, our other keynote speaker, Virasila Palindroma, is perhaps more um, a traditional leader of a feminist organisation, a Fiji Women's Rights Centre, which has been established with the help of aid donors and has done an enormous amount, of, a world of good for women in Fiji and, and across the region in terms of changing those gender roles. So I think we've got a mix of, of both. And I suppose we haven't mentioned gender really as one of the mm. transformations that's going on in the region, but I think that is also something that's a big focus of this conference, 
uh, is how are men's roles and women's roles changing in the face of all of this economic change and is there a backlash against women taking um, you know, more empowered roles within the economy? Uh, we're, we're tracking that through some research projects here at SSGM. Um, but are, are there other kind of shifts um, in gender roles like the influence of, say, Pentecostal Christianity that's um, just changing the way that men and women think about themselves and their relationships to each other? So we're getting a bit off track with the Australia <coughs> question, but I, but I think mm. too, um, I, and I don't know what our, I don't know our keynote speakers personally, but I think you know both of them are people who do their work in in uh, relationship to Australia, and we're very very pleased to have them here. But they both accepted our invitations very quickly, which we're, we're very grateful for. So I think um, if nothing else, Australia will have a a role in nurturing the talent in the Pacific um, in giving education in, in assisting people with skills and um, and I suppose developing those person-to-person -person relationships is that, that have an enormous depth of time um, and they're often not visible to mainstream Australia but people who, who live in the Pacific all have Australian friends, they follow Australian footy teams, there's a lot of um, very, very, very close cultural connections and, and increasingly they have relatives who live here as well mm. and, and I think that's that's also something that the conference will focus on is the flows of people between the Pacific and Australia and uh, and some of the futures of things like labour mobility schemes and how they contribute to the mix of a sustainable and prosperous Pacific deep into the future. Great. Well, thanks, gentlemen, for joining us today and uh, giving us an oversight of some of the challenges, opportunities, but also change which is taking place in the region. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And you can check in with the ANU iTunes channel for podcasts from the conference, from all our keynote speakers and panellists exploring these issues uh, in greater depth.